All right. We are into our third and final hour here for this Monday on One World Radio. Richard Segan on board. And we have a very special edition of Sunrise Cosmic Corner today. We have John Schwed, the author of the very fine biography of Sun Ra. Space is the place in the studio with us today. We're going to talk about Sun Ra. And John, it's great to have you in. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Let's see. Uh, let's see. All right. So, John, let's uh, let's start off with uh, how did you get interested in Sun Ra? Hmm. I was been wondering about that. I think <laughs> um, I think the first time I heard of him was in a in a piece by Norman Mailer which was being reprinted from a much earlier time when he described seeing them in rehearsal in Chicago. And he described, the, as I recall, as the, the effect of, a, of an electric drill inside your ear, uh, a screaming E. He said, but uh, this wasn't bad because it um, cleared a head call or infection he had within five minutes. And he said, I swear to God. I later um, asked him about that, and he said, well, actually, I thought they were awful. They were hideous. But I admired them for sticking with what they did. At any rate, I, I, was, I was drawn to this, and um, when I discovered somehow or other that they were playing at Slugs on the Lower East Side on uh, 3rd Street. I that was every Monday, right? Yeah, between C and D. That's kind of interesting because there were no Monday night performances at that time. It's hard to believe that. But uh, before the 60s, or even the, uh, toward the late 60s, all clubs were closed on Monday nights. It was a strange... Mm -hmm pattern of behavior and, and theaters were closed as well so it was it was a black night across new york and sun ra's idea was uh, and he sold a club on this that, that they'd play and uh, the musicians would come which is precisely what happened and this began to be a thing but what really interested me was that no one knew where this was there wasn't a lower east side yet and that's not true there was a lower east side there was no east village yet there was no, uh, Miguel Pinero had named it um, Alphabet City yet and so forth. So no one knew where this place was and, you, and cab drivers didn't want to take you there and there was no subway line. And I said, this is cool, I've got to go there until I saw the place. And it was, you had to walk through a bombed out zone and past the projects and then past the Hells Angels of New York, which that time was a, a, a real trip because they were throwing people off the roof and <laughs> manufacturing LSD and there was a, a seven foot guard out front Christmas music played and so forth. So this was the ultimate underground. It was the place where uh, people just didn't know about. Uh, and I thought, you know, I found the real thing here at last. Even the word underground wasn't being used except in a military sense at that time. And that was the start. I suppose um, it kind of hung on a while, but then when he moved to Philadelphia, where I was living and moved within a few miles of me, that was, uh, I suppose, somewhere I would say synchronicity, and um, this kind of kept me afloat with him for a long time. And then I realized when he was hitting 70s that no one was going to write a book about him, and what I guess more interested me more than that was I thought it was unwritable. I thought this was the one book no one's going to get out, or if they do, it'll, it'll be peculiar. So I thought uh, I'd have a go at it as a joke. And then it got hold of me, and I just kept staying on it. So, uh, this book here, uh, it seems like it took uh, many years in the making, and, uh, you know, you, you put a lot of time and energy into this one. It's pretty obvious. Uh, how long did it really take you to write the book? Mm, less than a year to write it um, part-time. Uh, about three and a half years of hanging out and calling people and doing things like that on a part-time basis. In fact, it occurred to me, oh, that sounds like a long time. If it's part-time, it's not that long. It occurred to me, I don't understand why people take years to write these books. And, you know, <laughs> professional writers, I don't know what that's about. Uh, they've got nothing else to do. What's the problem? Um, maybe they write better than me. But it was, I suppose, you know, it's more than that. It's having listened to this stuff over the years. And, and, and um, I think... What was sort of daunting to me was that when I started, there was no list of all the records, so I only could guess. And when I found out when such a list did appear, Robert Campbell's discography, that there were uh, over 120-some LPs and, and singles. And this is not like if you look at Miles Davis, say, well, he's got 122. You find out that most of those are reissues and repackagings, but these were all fresh records. Uh, where, you know, where will I ever find out what these records are, or much less where they are. Uh, I finally heard them all, at least I've heard all those that have been accounted for so far, and I have them on tape mostly. And uh, just before I started writing, I decided to listen to them all. 
it took me two and a half weeks. Um, I put it in an eight-hour day. And, and the message of this is that you can't keep, in, although I kept notes, you can't keep in your head what you heard four days before if you're listening continuously. This is real work, and, and, and uh, I don't advise it for anybody. So I forgot most of what I was hearing, although every now and then I'd find in my notes a star saying, you know, check this out or whatever, and that kind of guided me back through things. So I had to write a piece recently for The Wire, the British um, rock magazine, a kind of guide to uh, the Sun Ra records, and that was tough because they had to rethink this stuff. But since they were only using things in print, that uh, to ease it up a bit. Since what? What do you think? There are 40 things in print right now? 30-something? Oh, at least... Yeah, but I didn't have to deal with a hundred and some. Right, yeah. Well, um, did you ever get a chance to talk to Sun Ra about the book? Uh, no. Uh, well, I did, actually. I went to see him just before he died, and uh, it was kind of um, peculiar. The records were just coming out, and he was mostly interested in that. But he's very depressed. Uh, he got more depressed after that. But he had already declared just a short time before that he wasn't going to write what he was going to write. He said he was going to write his Cosmo autobiography and then um, got angry and said there was no reason to do it. And when someone asked him why, he said um, uh, he said there was no reason to do it. And they said, well, you know, if you don't write it now, people uh, uh, 400 years from now won't know who you were. And to which he said, if people don't intend to live forever, there's no reason for them to have to have this. <laughs> um I, so I never talked to him about it. I was about to bring it up. It was pretty depressing because my own father was dying at the si time he was dying. He used to come from visiting my father to visiting him. So was, these are. I took a week to get over these these uh, these weird experiences. Um, no, the <laughs> the short answer is no. I never got to talk to him about it. Okay. Um, but you did get to talk to a lot of people involved with his early life, uh, some of his family members and, and some of those people that he actually played music with back in Alabama. Mm. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, you know, it's not unusual for um, musicians and artists to destroy some of their works if they figure they don't fit in with what they're, they're doing later on. I think two interesting cases of that are John Coltrane destroying his early alto saxophone things and Bill Evans not wanting his um, teenage stuff to be known and, and wanting his sister to destroy it which she didn't do although she holds on to and when you hear it you say I don't I don't see the problem here it, what you hear is a very strong left hand maybe that would surprise you on a pianist who played mostly without a strong left hand but you know it doesn't fit with the pattern that they want the world to remember them by Sun Ra seemed to be trying to destroy a third of his life to edit it right out of existence. So I thought um, there was going to be some great revelation here of some sort. But when I got to know the people around him, I, I realized that the things he wanted forgotten were all success stories. Uh, valedictorian of his class, although he didn't accept it, uh, number seven in his class in college. By the way, um, the top student in his year at uh, Alabama A&M uh, had a grade point average of 3.03. .03. Sun Ra was 3.01. Um, if I read that right, if you, they must have been giving no A's. If the best <laughs> student had slightly over a B, they must have had one A somewhere along the line. Amazing. <laughs> I have no idea what the average grade would have been like. But anyway, he, he had uh, the most popular uh, band of his time in, in that state. Um, there was nothing that I could find that was any reason for him to have lost that part of his life, except he was moving to a new self. He was reinventing himself, and this was inconvenient. He never, uh, although people talked to him hiding the stuff, um, as the years went on, he hid less and less and talked about it more and more. And if you, if you stuck with him like people like... Uh, uh, the um, uh, the two brothers on the West Coast, the printers, whose names are slipping me, who printed his material over the years and talked to him for hundreds of hours. They seemed to have heard stories that nobody else had heard, even in the members of the band. So it was not that he was totally keeping it a secret, and that was how he was able to do this. Plus, his his uh, former musicians and so forth were much in awe of him, and um, that made it a lot easier, I think. Yeah. Now, one, one interesting thing about Sun Ra was that he had a great sense of humor. It was tremendous, but a lot of people misinterpreted that sense of humor uh, when he started talking about his cosmic philosophy. 
And one thing that I learned from Sun Ra was that he was deadly serious about this stuff, and he did have a great sense of humor and did, you know, was really happy to make people laugh. For, but he was really serious about this stuff, and a lot of my friends over the years just didn't get that, that he actually believed in this space stuff. They thought so, it was a joke? Yeah. Well, it's a, a long joke. Yeah, really. But, you know, the guy wouldn't walk on the street dressed like that if it was just a joke, you know. That's the way he dressed all the time. Well, the problem with that point of view is what do you do then with Lee Perry and, and um, George Clinton and Dr. Octagon and um, X-Clan and Professor X? and um, This is a collective joke? <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> this, is a, <laughs> this is a multi-generational collective joke? I mean, you, you'd have to... Be, uh, for that matter, if you've heard in, in reggae and and uh, listen to Rasta material and so forth, you know, you must have gotten a clue that there's some affinities here. Uh, that's, you know... This is not to say that Sun Ra wasn't a jokester. He was a classic jokester. Oh, yeah. And the guy, you know, I, he cracked me up many times. But uh, he was, you know, t to my ears, you know, and I, I saw Sun Ra about 70 times. And I've listened to a lot of music uh, throughout my whole life. It's been a main source of uh, inspiration for me. But I found that Sun Ra had the most uh, advanced musical knowledge of anybody that I ever encountered. And mm -hmm. I don't have a problem saying that he was probably the greatest musician that ever entered our global area here. Yeah, he and did have enormous uh, reach in the stuff. And, I'm, and I'm, at the moment, I'm, I'm thinking about doing yet another book on on, um, on Miles Davis, partly because um, the previous books weren't terribly good, but mostly because they, don't, um, uh, with one exception, didn't like anything he did after the late 60s, where I thought he got very interesting. But I, I've been thinking a lot about what, what Miles Davis knew, and he was a very narrow guy until the 60s. When he began to listen to country music, uh, Willie Nelson, of course, he was involved with, um, uh, Karl Heinz Stockhausen, um, Pendereski. So he's listening to European classical music, uh, electronic music, country music, uh, Indian music. He got interested in uh, classical music of India. And then, as we know, he got into rap and uh, reggae and lots of other things. Um, Yet he had, frankly, didn't have the knowledge that Sun Ra had, or the breadth. Now, it, it would seem amazing for a guy in his 50s and going to 60s to suddenly open up like Miles Davis did, but Sun Ra went into almost his 80s with this kind of breadth, uh, who recorded with uh, John Cage and uh, appeared on the stand with all kinds of other people, including Jerry Lee Lewis at one point. Um, so this, he was exceptional in that respect. I mean, it's not just that he was a musician and exceptionally broad. Most people don't have the willingness to be that broad musically, and it seems to have gotten narrower over the years. People seem to cut off what they did. I mean, this was being talked about the other night on um, on an Internet chat group. We were saying, uh, how is it that um, so many people were so narrow in the 70s when Miles' electric band appeared, and they didn't seem to know what was going on, and they were so negative about it? And this went back and forth. They talked about it. And someone said, then, what about now? You know, why is it people still don't have that kind of breadth and be able to see the links that reach across, say, Prince to uh, John Coltrane, which, um, which Miles saw? And which, of course, some, um, some rock musicians have always seen. People like um, Iggy Pop always saw this connection and, and, and a number of the punks. But, um, hey, we're not, in the, uh, we're not in the Renaissance anymore. You know, an educated person... Is a, a person who's lived is, doesn't have to know music. I mean, it's like, you know. Uh, a friend of mine said to a musician the other day, I don't understand it. You go to the Museum of Modern Art, people are lined up to see paintings that they will tell you while they're in line they don't like. And while they're going through the museum, they'll tell you they don't understand it, they don't like it, but they'll line up and pay the money. Take them to a club where there's some music that's slightly off what they know, and they say, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Well, you know, and this is interesting because uh, you're talking about Miles, and I was always a big fan of Miles until I read, you know, a quote from Miles where he badmouthed Sun Ra mm. really terribly, and that turned me off. What did you say? They said, How? Well, he just said that he just made a bunch of, you know, it wasn't that jungle music thing that Dizzy Gillespie said, but it was essentially the same kind of thing. He's just mm. making a bunch of noise. Mm. And, uh, you know, I said, if Miles is going to say that in print, you know, he, mm. he, I don't know if he deserves my respect or not, <laughs> because Sun Ra obviously was more advanced than Miles and more advanced than Mozart. He yeah. said, he referred to it as European at one point. Uh, well, Sun Ra was, he said, this sounds like Raymond Scott. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, 
But, you know, Miles badmouthed everybody, too, so... It's know. true, except the Fifth Dimension, <laughs> which he thought was the great rock group. <laughs> I mean, it's very hard to take this guy seriously at some points, right? Yeah, He true. just trashed Stevie Wonder when he was talking oh. about that. He said... They played with Stevie Wonder thing when Stevie was a saint. You couldn't do any wrong. He had, everything he did was a hit. And uh, he listened to the record and said, Now there's a sad case. <laughs> this cat plays 26 instruments, all of them badly. <laughs> 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 then he started talking about the fifth dimension. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Well, um, I think, well, why don't we hear a little bit of Sun Ra music now? I know uh, one of the albums that you like and I like also is called Lanquidity. I know uh, Robert Campbell doesn't like it, but uh, that doesn't mean that it's not good because Robert's not always 100% correct, even though he's a great Sun Ra scholar. Well, a lot of people don't like it, which is which is interesting. I, I, I have one little note in The Wire when I, I, ended, I said ended my piece um, talking about what you might listen to to get into Sun Ra, and I had this at the end because it's not available. I just said, you know, you should not stop with what's available and look for these other things. And I said, Languidity is, frankly, disco-inspired, but nonetheless subliminally corrosive music. <laughs> I think it's true. This is music that you say, nah, I don't know, this is not good dance music, this is not, you know, you know something's not good jazz, whatever. But it sort of corrodes you as you listen to it slowly. Yeah. Well, we're going to hear the most corrosive of all. There are other worlds they have not told you of, and they wish to speak to you. Right here on Sunrise Cosmic Corner. Hi, this is John Gilmore. When I touch down on the planet Earth, I keep my space in place by listening to WHUS in stores. speak with sound. My voice can be heard by the world. I speak a language all my own. speak of many things, things hidden, things in the dark, things in the light, things in strange dimensions. Things on this planet, other planets, and the planets unknown. I am I am an instrument. I speak of the spirit.
instrument, but man is an instrument too. But he cannot speak unless someone touches the strings of his heart. And when his heart speaks, it, it is, can speak more things than the mind can. people are the instrument. The heart is a drum. It's a drum. too and so is every, every person the people are the instrument
You are tuned to WHUS Stores, 91.7 FM. We're listening to an expanded uh, version of Sunrise Cosmic Corner here today. We have John Schwed in the studio, the author of the uh, Sunrise biography, Space is the Place. We're very happy to have John in. And uh, he actually just brought that CD in for me. I'd never seen it before. It's just a, uh, a single piece of Sun Ra poetry. John, could you tell us a little bit about this? Do you know anything at all yeah, about it? Yeah, it was brought out from a series of um, limited editions from Blast First, a British company that's uh, kind of interesting, and it was available for the time through The Wire, the magazine. Now apparently it's just available otherwise. Oddly enough, they seem not to have not sold out any of these limited editions, even though there were only 500 <laughs> copies of them, people like uh, Lee, um, Ronaldo, and Solo, and so forth. But this particular one came in a nice box with, um, with a video, which included uh, Space is the Place, and also a Phil Niblock a uh, film from, must be from the 60s, in which the orchestra is shot in um, swirling negative co- uh, black and white. Is that the Cry of Jazz? Is that the one? Or no, 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 this is, um, that was a documentary. Oh. This is uh, just an art film. Okay, yeah, I have seen it. So you can't see any of the faces or anything, right? Yeah. You have seen it. Yeah, I saw it at a show, actually, at a Sun Rock concert mm-hmm. one time. Um yeah, that sounds like an interesting uh, box. I'm going to have to pick that up myself. Yeah, and the price is reasonable. I forget what they were. It's something like... Uh, Twenty-five dollars. You're getting a double video and and a, and a CD as well. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, John, you wanted to uh, maybe read a, a segment of your book over the air and maybe uh, give the listeners some yeah, ideas. Yeah, read something very quick. This is just something I found interesting. It was um, I spoke before about Slugs and Sun Rock coming to New York and first performing, um, getting a regular gig at Slugs. And what was interesting to me, among other things, is that it was the New York Times that discovered Sun Ra first. The Village Voice, was six years later, seemed to have woke up to this, although they were only down the street, um, and they always pride themselves as being on top of everything. The description is from uh, John S. Wilson, who was music critic at the time, and he sort of stumbled into this. The costumes for the night were glittering golden pullover blouses and soft yellow straw and cloth hats molded into jaunty shapes, bells, beads, African print shirts, scarves of polka dots of all sizes and hues, medallions of silver and gold around their necks. Sun Ra wore a long golden robe, his head encircled by two golden bands. In addition to the usual instruments, the orchestra had an amplified koto, a Nigerian horn, a kora, Chinese violins, an oriental lute, and a number of sun columns, golden metal tubes with rubber bottoms which gave off a sound when they were struck, and a small gold electronic box which played music. Musicians spilled out into the audience, instrument cases piled high around them. Lights might go off in some pieces, come back on or blink off and on. Sometimes a motion picture with no obvious relation to what they were playing was projected behind them on the wall. Seated in the back of the bandit slugs, hidden behind piano, clavinet, and space master, an organ made for him by the Chicago Musical Instrument Company that sounded like a theremin or bagpipes, Sun Rock could sometimes be seen picking up a one-stringed instrument he called a Chinese violin. Occasionally, he shyly conducted with a thin wand topped with a peacock feather. But then all the members of the orchestra were partially veiled by the lighting. And in a period in which individual musicians were as distinct and celebrated as sports stars, their anonymity was all the more striking. During the same period, drama critic Stefan Brecht, the son of, by the way, of uh, Bertolt Brecht, Brecht, wrote about his visit to Slugs in the Evergreen Review. He thought the recreations from the swing era that they mixed in with the more abstract music were in bad taste, but said he had noticed the same kind of thing pervading the playing of Charlie Parker. There's something, probably something here I didn't get, he said. At the end of the review, he added this note. These piano solos during the three-hour sets introduce a historical sequence of jazz styles leading through the big band sound of the 40s, through cool jazz to the shrieking bird saxophone solos of the 60s, up to the cosmic reproduction and sound matter of the true Sun Ra, which is now an out-of-history, a spatial music. That is, they serve to get us from our historical place into absolute reality. That bad taste I referred to is our own. Whether Sun Ra shares it is another matter. He's not ironic. Huh. This, these were the first two people to have heard, at least publicly record, their um, experiences in slugs in the year 1964-65. Well, I didn't get a chance to go to slugs, but I did get to go to squat to quite a few of those shows that they started playing yeah, at squat. Right and and uh, that's where they first performed Nuclear War, when Sunra asked all the good people to leave the room. You know, <laughs> <laughs> The B-52s used to hang out there. That's um, what... 
let's see who else uh, the squad um, a bunch of soap actors which was always hard <laughs> to understand why um, John Cage came in once Philip Glass um, and Dorothy Dendridge sat in one night on piano the both of them played duo wow. which would have been one of the weirdest scenes in the history of music I bet wow Dorothy Dendridge being an older woman with a classical background who enjoys playing, let's say, boogie-woogie versions of Chopin and is a very flamboyant player, uh, something like you'd find in, um, in an old-time bar with a noisy piano player who sang and waved their arms around. The two of them together was just bizarre. The, their link, apparently, was that they'd both been friends of Fletcher Henderson. She used to go to the horse races with him a lot. And uh, I think Dandridge's father was, yeah, he was from Birmingham, so they probably had a family-type link at some point. That's more far out than uh, Cecil Taylor and Mary Lou Williams. Oh, I think. <laughs> in fact, uh, she used to travel with the band uh, from time to time in the bus. And he once said she could probably take over for him. Um, Gilmore at least believed that was a, a real possibility. I, the, I don't think the rest of the band knew what they would be in for if that ever <laughs> happened. Wow. Um, do you think that there's any uh, possibility for the band to ever get a keyboardist at this point? Well, several people have offered. Um, Rodney Kendrick... Um, interesting player and uh, what's his name from Philadelphia um, oh uh, a guy who recorded with um, Sonny Murray uh, kind of the uh. enormous range plays stride piano smashes his arms the keyboard blocking his name Burton Green no no, no um, older player um, I know I want to say Don Pullen it's not Pullen Anyway, he's huh. a, a Philadelphia pianist of uh, who's always appreciated. Of course, Cecil Taylor was supposed to play at one point. Yeah, but I remember that. Didn't that. Happen. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's a new, you know, it's a new band. Um, were you at the um, memorial concert at the bottom line where uh, the Sun Ra Memorial? Yeah, where Stanley yeah. Jordan yes. stood in. Yeah. Well, Jordan could get a kind of Sun Ra pianistic effect out of his guitar. In fact, yeah. I was kind of shocked how different he sounded on that gig. And the band enjoyed that and said that they, they knew he could play. And, yeah. And Jordan isn't going anywhere with his current career, so this would be a nice twist, but hmm. whether it'll happen, I don't yeah. know. Um, Marshall Allen is currently the leader of the band, and I remember talking to you recently, and you said that Marshall was working on a solo project. Yeah, he's hmm. done a, a few. He did one in London, and uh, apparently is doing a couple others. Um, it's funny how the press records thing. I was in, interested to see what happened to the British one, and I, I saw a write-up that said, that in the middle of his performance, he started on alto, he suddenly threw his alto saxophone on the floor and played flute through the rest of it. And I said, that's interesting. Uh, it didn't sound right, but whatever. So I asked Marshall about it, and he said, oh, the strap broke, and it fell on the floor, and he could see the neck was bent, so he had to finish on the flute. But, huh. you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. interesting reading of that. Yeah, Marshall uh, is not going to let anything get in his way. <laughs> Uh, you know, my feeling, the greatest alto saxophone player that we've ever had on the planet, and uh, I'm really happy that he's still around and leading the group. And he never wanted to be a leader, but he's been pushed into it, and uh, the band sounds good. The last few times I've heard him, I've enjoyed the shows quite a bit. So The thing is, uh, there are hundreds of pieces that they've ever recorded that are still in their book, and yeah, um, it'd be wonderful to hear them. I, I, in fact, I said to Marshall one day, you know, this stuff is really um, important, and you've only got one copy of it. Don't you think you should make copies? And he didn't think that was a particularly good idea. And then I saw him later, and he said, I've copied the book. I said, really? And I said, great. And he showed me you know, the Xerox copy of it, and I said, where's the rest of it? He was, I just copied my part. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I guess he figured you could reconstruct it from that. Yeah, yeah. Mm. The Sun Ra book was uh, humongous. It was like bigger than the Bible, and there were several of them. It turns out, you know, I, I thought I, I took a, I went through um, uh, Jackson's bassoon part and wrote down the titles that hadn't been recorded. And when uh, Marshall came in, Jackson showed him my list, and he said, "But well, what about the other book?" Which I <laughs> never went through. So there's more. Yeah. Well, there's so much stuff with Sun Ra. Like even uh, one time I saw them probably a year or so ago, and they played Angel Demons at play, which I'd never heard Sun Ra play in all my years of seeing him, uh, and it was really nice to hear that. So the band is pulling out some things, and Michael Ray also is pulling out some old pieces of Sun Ra that weren't recorded, I, I believe, in his Cosmic Crew shows. So it's nice to keep the legacy going. You know that um, 
Sun Ra had been working on what he called a Moonwalker set, because what he was going to do at the Moonwalker Club in, in where is it, in uh, Vienna? On, on, Onberg, Germany. I, Germany, yeah. okay. And he was going to do a set of mix of a medley of um, Michael Jackson and Van Morrison moon-oriented material, but it never happened. Yes. In fact, they only worked on one Michael Jackson thing, and um, rumors spread that there was a Michael Jackson album and so on, but it's not true. <laughs> Um, you said you heard most of the Sun Ra stuff. Did you ever hear the uh, Batman and Robin record, mm. the Dick and Dale or whatever? Yeah. You you have. How is that? Can you actually hear the orchestra? There's only three or four people. Uh, you can hear Sun Ra on organ. Uh, when he's not on organ, it's um, Al Cooper. Um, that's one you can miss, I think. it's uh, What it was <laughs> is, is um, Edward Bland, who was their promoter at one time, the filmmaker who did... Um, the Cry of Jazz was then an arranger and, and booker of things. This was a children's record that was sold at toy stores, uh, Tiflin Records, I believe, Tiffin Records from Newark. And he paid for the rights to the Batman theme, but in order to get this out under budget, everything else is public domain. So there's a Tchaikovsky theme, there's uh, some children's song. It's not an exciting record. And mm -hmm. well, throughout it all are twangy guitars, because that was the idea that Batman and Robin being played by sort of surf guitar mm -hmm. people. <laughs> with What's interesting is when you hear Sun Ra, there are big booming organ chords that are popping in in funny places. And, mm -hmm. um, no, I'd say it's no more interesting than the um, Phil... Um, oh, what's his name? I want to say uh, the guy, uh, Chicago blues-oriented guy, Upsh... Phil Upshaw? Upchurch. No, Upchurch, yeah. Phil Upchurch's record, with, which has Sun Ra's people on it, it's not that, you know, it's not that much. Or for that matter, the um, uh, thing called Drums, 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 you got a whole string of titles, mm -hmm. um, by Olin Tunji, which has Sun Ra people on it. They, they're really buried in these records. Yeah, I actually have one called Ola Tunji, where Marshall and Pat Patrick play uh, flutes and some saxes. That's what I mean. That one is, that's just called Ola Tunji. That's not oh, the same that's record. That's not the same one. It's oh. not the same one. It's a different one. And this one is quite good. There's mm. a couple of tracks where, you know, Marshall is, you know, you really can hear him quite well. So, Do you know the story about uh, Sonny Chirac going to Sun Ra for a job? No. He said, he ran into him on the street, literally, and he said, um, well, come to rehearsal, but you put him off in another room and had him watch two films. One was the orchestra in Egypt, and the other was a film about statues and how when the wind blows right and you rotate them, you can make them sing. So he sat there and watched these films. The rehearsal went on next door, and then uh, Chirac uh, spoke to Sun Rife and said, well, I've watched the films. Good, he said. I'll talk to you later. Meanwhile, Olin Tunji called... Sun Ron said, I need a guitar player. So he said, well, I've got this guy, uh, Sonny Chirac. So Sonny got a job with Owen Tunji. But he said, the point is that Sun Ron never heard him play. Now, this is the reverse of what Sonny said about working with Miles Davis. He's on the Jack Johnson record, uncredited. And Sun Ron is? No, um, uh, Sonny Chirac. Chirac. And oh. people who know him can hear the sound. It's Stunt McLaughlin. It's him. And um, about a year later... Miles Davis called him and said, um, uh, Sonny, you want to go to Europe with my band? He said, yeah. He says, all right, come over for an audition. And he said, audition I recorded with you. Well, we always have auditions. He said, I'm going to come over and audition. It's ridiculous. And he said, then forget it. About a year later, Miles said, I was just kidding. We expected you to be at the plane. <laughs> <laughs> So, Sonny was not that far out with his uh, organizational practices. Well, Sonny Chirac would have been a great addition to the orchestra. He was a tremendous, yeah. tremendous player. Very adaptable, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, one of the great ones. Well, we've only got a couple of minutes left here, John. Um, do you have any uh, closing words you'd like to say? And by the way, I'd like uh, all you listeners out there to uh, go out and pick up this book. It's a great book. The Pantheon Press, Space is the Place by John Schwed. And uh, pick it up. Uh, I can only second that again. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I, I, I've been offered the chance to write the George Clinton biography, and I um, and there's money in it and so forth. But my response was that, you know, with all due respect, I don't think he's as rich a, a subject. Um, I think he's a genius, a pop music genius, and and uh, you know, maybe one of the most important people in, in music in the second part of this century. But um, he, you know, Sun Ra goes on forever. There's a there's a depth there. Um, I sound like I'm sliding George Clinton, which I don't mean to do. It's just, you know, it's sort of, it doesn't have the challenge to it. Although yeah. I guess the challenge with Clinton is just getting with Clinton and staying with him. <laughs> you know, you, I, do you know where he held his last press conference? 
Uh, no. Well, you know, the last time they went on tour, it was at an abandoned hangar at an airfield in upstate New York. And, uh, <laughs> of course, everyone expected to find the mothership there, but it's a, that's in the, actually in the, someone's backyard in D.C. <laughs> they sold it for money. So one, one reporter announcing that this press conference is going to be held said, um, I, I've been afraid to look. But, you know, it may be Hangar, uh, what is it, the Roswell thing? Hangar 80? Oh, yeah. You know, 87? <laughs> well. At any rate, he would be interesting, but somehow I feel like it. it's on another plane than, than Sun Ra. Well, you're right. And uh, actually, uh, you probably could write another one on Sun Ra, even, because you, you finished mm, the book probably yeah. in the... But in then the I'd be getting in this groove of uh, what would come next, Lee Perry, then Dr. Octagon? And <laughs> the Lee Perry book would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. like that. Lee Perry's <laughs> too heavy for me. <laughs> <laughs> the last interview he said, he said, uh, someone said, how do you know that? And he said, because I'm Jesus Christ himself. And the guy said, really? He said, so are you, man. <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. Well, I've considered Scratch the Sun Ra of uh, Jamaica anyhow, so. <laughs> All right, well, I want to thank John Schwed quite a bit for taking the time out from his busy schedule to come up here at stores today and talk to us about the Sun Ra and the Sun Ra uh, biography and uh, hopefully we'll be seeing John soon. I think he's going to be taken off with the orchestra to uh, Germany in uh, November. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. With a bunch of rappers so, and oh wow, that's going to be cool. and all right. And he did mention that the orchestra is going to be playing in uh, the Ninny Factory in December, so we'll definitely get those dates down and let you know about that. And right now it's uh, time for Afternoon Rock with Lisa, so t- stay tuned for that. I'll be back next week. Uh, tune in from Noja on One World Radio tomorrow, and uh, have a great one. Space is the place.